We're going to go to our third lecture. What are the effects of ultrafiltration on cardiopulmonary bypass? John Ingram, BSCCP, no disclosures. Yeah, thank it's you. all yours. Thank you, Joe. Uh, just to follow up what we were just finishing up on our discussion, and as uh, I would say in the last five or six years when <clears throat> I've been traveling and hearing uh, the, the people claim that there's ills of the hemoconcentrator, I, I wanted to research it myself. I wanted to find out if there was something I'm missing or something I was taught wrong or something that's happened along the way that uh, would cause me to, um, so I went, went back a little bit and tried to, um, tried to learn you know, as much as I could about it. So this is kind of a, a, a summary of, of uh, some of the information that I found. And so we, we're calling this, uh, I call this lecture, what are the effects of ultra, ultra filtration on cardiopulmonary bypass? So what are the benefits, first of all? And then are there negative effects of using the ultra filtrator on, on bypass? And a question comes up now, nowadays, does it reduce urine output? And I've heard that many times, you know, if, if you use him concentrate, oh, the urine, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna harden the kidney, you know, kidneys aren't gonna be able to produce any urine. It doesn't make I sense. I was told the other day by a perfusionist that every time I've used the hemoconcentrator, the urine output came to a complete stop. I have done over 5,000 procedures hemoconcentrator. I don't think I've ever seen that. Complete stop in urine the second you started using the hemoconcentrator? No, I've never have, seen have that Have you either. seen that? I've never no. seen that. Uh, does it dehydrate the patient? That's another thing that I've heard. Well, you know, you're gonna dehydrate the patient. Uh, and I, this is one we hear all the time. So does it cause acute kidney injury? So I think this is a very pertinent topic nowadays because you know we've, we've known for decades that it has enormous benefits, and now we're hearing all these ills to the point where people are even not using it at all. Okay, so the comprehensive reference for this particular presentation that I'm, I'm using for everyone's knowledge is one of the Bibles of, of cardiopulmonary bypass, Gravely's a uh, book that I did with Richard Davis, Mark Carews, and Joe Utley, very, very heavy, heavy hitters in the field of cardiac surgery and perfusion, and the second edition. Uh, in chapter seven, Dr. Roger Moore, director of anesthesia, and Dr. Glenn Lobb, director of cardiac surgery out of uh, New Jersey at the time, do a chapter specifically on hemofiltration, dialysis, blood salvage techniques during cardiopulmonary bypass. Now this chapter has over 256 references that these gentlemen use in addition to their own expertise, in addition to the four authors of the book who also uh, scrutinized what they did. And I took the very first part of the chapter which only covered hemofiltration. This part of the chapter has 73 references that these gentlemen use as part of the structure of their chapter. So I'm gonna actually Refer to this the most, I think 90% of the lecture that I'm gonna give has to do with this. I'm gonna introduce some other articles as well, uh, and also give you these 73 references blow by blow as they go through them. So let's look at the historical perspective. Why did we ever have hemoconcentrator? How did it come to be? Why did we use it? In 1928, the concept emerged uh, of removing excess fluid from the intravascular space by filtrating the blood through some type of ultraporous membrane. The, the concept was, was derived and they were trying to come up with ways to make that happen. In the 1950s and 60s, uh, clinical applications emerged as a filtering devices were developed for effective removal of edema in renal failure patients, right? In the 70s, it was first used in cardiac surgery and it was found to be very effective in reducing hemodilution and resulting in higher post-operative hematocrits. And by 79, ultrafiltration was extended to the use during cardiopulmonary bypass, but is initially limited to patients with compromised renal function. Mm -hmm. By the 1980s, uh, the use of ultrafiltration became general clinical practice. Um, patients in renal failure could now undergo open heart surgery safely because of the hemoconcentrator. It then expanded its use to concentrating blood in just overhydrated patients. Didn't have to be renal failure. Could just be an overhydrated patient. Um, let's see if that clicker will work. Not work. Okay. It was then recognized, it was then became a recognized method for blood conservation through the preservation of platelets and coagulation factors. And you recall, Joe, in the 80s when, you know, cell saver really, really exploded. And some people were pointing out the fact that, you know, if you did run the blood through the hemoconcentrator, you're saving a lot of the things that are lost through the cell saver. We're going to talk about that briefly. Absolutely. In the true. 1990s, evidence emerged that there was a greatly reduced post 
post-bypass inflammatory responses and a reduced immun immunological activation when patients were used, uh, were used on bypass with the hemoconcentrator. Uh, evidence emerged that there was decreased complement activation and decreased inflammatory response. Um, this resulted in post-operative improvements in pulmonary, cardiac, and neurological function. Uh, ultrafiltration provided additional benefit, actually they discovered, of moderating infections in post-operative period because it also removed circulating pyrogens. This was all in, in uh, discoveries in the 90s when people really began to use it. So what are the known benefits now of, of hemoconcentration? Well, first, it, pre it preserves hemostasis in the, in the sense that if you use the ultrafiltrator to concentrate and preserve, it'll, it'll preserve platelets and clotting factors. It provides for better post-operative hemostasis than techniques of cell washing. I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, downplaying cell washing, but when you just compare it, everyone knows that it will preserve and, and keeps um, uh, your platelets and coagulation factors, where in cell in cell washing you, you're you're discarding them. Yeah, and I and think, there's there's and, pros and cons to both. And but well, and I think that that's you know with your post pump blood circuit, no one would advocate. And I just want to make it clear, you know, for anybody that's confused, not and I don't think it's because you're confused or confusing, but no one is advocating collecting blood for cell, mm -hmm. from a cell saver in a in a bring back heart or a non-cardiac patient and giving it back as whole blood run through a hemoconcentrator. We're talking about your post-pump leftover blood. Correct. Yeah. And then everyone knows out there, I'm sure, that if you had 800 or so cc's in your pump, you can run it through the cell saver and you're going to get red cells and it's fine. But if you concentrated that through the hemoconcentrator, you'd end up with whole blood giving back. Yes, and, and concentrated a, and, whole blood. Yeah, and there's a preservation of the platelets and coagulation factors. Non-suction collected blood, right? Non-suction non collected. So, of course, if you look at the cell saver, it, it takes whole blood in and... It separates into plasma platelets and white cells, and then red blood cells accumulate at the bottom because they're heavier. And then, of course, you're going to have plasma and platelets, which are discharged as loss. And then you have saved red blood cells that you end up with. And that's, that's fine. That's a good process. And the hemoconcentrator, you take in whole blood as well. It comes into the hemo, hemoconcentrator. And basically, you have concentrated whole blood that comes out because all that you're removing is the plasma water. You're keeping the entire thing. Okay. So thereby it preserves plasma platelets and white blood cells and red blood cells. So in the uh, chapter by Gravely, these are all the reference articles that show that it's going to pr help preserve hemostasis compared to losing the platelets and plasma. So it also found that it reduced the immune response when you use hemofilter on bypass. Ultrafiltration has been found to immensely reduce serum concentrations of tissue necrosis factor, which is a very powerful active cytokine in the very acute phase of inflammation. TNF. Reduces complement. Now, complement fragment three is a whole host of, of uh, complements, but this plays a central role in the activation of the complement system. It also removes something called myoperoxidase. This is a cy cytotoxic mediator, which also produces hypochlorous acid, something people don't talk about too often. But here's a quote from the chapter. 24 hours after ultrafiltration, the pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukins 1, 6, and 8, neutrophil levels, and oxidative stress enzyme levels are all decreased compared with patients who did not receive ultrafiltration. Here's all the articles that uh, they refer to as well as their own expertise. Uh, for that for that statement. What about end organ effects? Directly related to the immunological response, ultrafiltration provides significant improvements in end organ integrity. In particular, it was discovered that pulmonary, cardiac, renal, and neurologic end organ integrity was improved. But let's look at each one. In the pulmonary, the removal of complement active uh, complement three Activator 3 with ultrafiltration reduces post-operative pulmonary vascular resistance and reduces the need for intensive post-operative ventilator support. It improved clinical outcomes with ultrafiltration with faster extubation times and improved post-operative alveolar oxygenation. Ultrafiltration leads to a decrease in pulmonary edema. Well, that makes sense. Uh, increased post-bypass pulmonary compliance. If you have less pulmonary edema, Slug, you know, no sluggishness of your lung tissue, you're having a better pulmonary compliance. They also found that 
you have a decrease in your mean airway pressure. Again, you have much more compliant lungs. But it also improved the total pulmonary status. In other words, when we started using hemoconcentrator, and what I showed in the history in the 80s and 90s, people would come out in the post-operative phase and they noticed this patient doesn't need to be on 60% of oxygen, they only need to be on 40%. They don't need to be on a, a 15 of PEEP, they only need to be on five of PEEP. You know, what's going on here? So the whole in pulmonary status was improved. And here are the, the reference articles, again, from this uh, section of the chapter. What about cardiac? They found that the use of ultrafiltration uh, was related to improved post-bypass hemodynamic function, including heart rate, increased systolic pressure, higher cardiac index, reduced pulmonary vascular resistance, improved diastolic compliance, and this is a quote from the chapter. The improved hemodynamics may be directly related to a decrease in the myocardial inflammatory response, leading to a decrease in myocardial edema and improved lymph ventricular compliance. And here's all the reference articles that these gentlemen used for that particular aspect of the chapter. What about the renal benefits? Interleukin-1, tissue necrosis factor. These are very powerful inflammatories, by the way, very, very powerful ones. And interleukin-8 are pro-inflammatory agents that induce leukocyte adhesion to the renal arterial endothelial cells, thereby obstructing intravascular blood flow and initiating the inflammatory sequence. Studies have verified that early institution of continuous hemofiltration led to a significant restoration of renal function. Mm -hmm. Remember that diagram that I had? It showed that leukocyte infiltration, mm -hmm. okay, which is what this, what interleukin-1, TNF, and uh, interleukin-8 are, uh, are causing within that inflammatory process. Right. Um, here are the, uh, some of the references they used in that chapter. What about the neurologic benefits that were, that were discovered? Let's see. Ultrafiltration leads to a decrease in cerebral edema, resulting in decreased int intravascular water, increased cerebral oxygen in delivery, improved cerebral metabolic oxygen consumption, removal of leukocyte-related mediators, mediators. Here's a quote from the chapter. Use of modified ultrafiltration after deep hypothermic circulatory rest, which they looked at specifically because when you want to look at neurologic, what's the worst case scenario? Our circulatory rest patients. Mm -hmm. So when they looked at that, they showed that Use of modified ultrafiltration after circulatory rest has been ready to improve post-operative brain function. Here's all the uh, studies that they use from that. So let's talk about the negative effects, what people want to uh, focus on. Does it reduce urine output? The hemoconcentrator is simply aiding the kidney in its endeavor to reduce the excess volume. It has no direct ill effect on renal function. It may indirectly decrease urine output only in so far as reducing the total fluid volume, volume overload that the kidney must remove. This paper uh, is a more recent paper because of the chapter that I was just talking about goes back uh, a few years. But here's a paper by Rick Kuntz and David Holt. And these gentlemen I've known for uh, almost 30 years. I, I hold a lot of, a lot of stock in what, in what they would say. Uh, and I think most people know, know both of them, as well as their partners. And they wrote a paper called Effects of Conventional Ultrafiltration on Renal Performance During Adult Cardiopulmonary Bypass Receivers Procedures came out in Journal of Extraportal Technology 2006. The purpose of this study was to investigate the effects of aggressive conventional hemofiltration. They took off an average of 6,500 cc's. That's a they lot. Actually, I've done that. They actually purposely, during the procedure, added plasma light A or normosol, mm -hmm. and just for the benefit of being able to continually remove as much fluid as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, my point of that is that if, if you are gonna have a negative effect from use of the hemoconcentrator, these gentlemen went after it because they had as much as 10 to 12, 6,500 was the mean. It was plus or minus 25, 3,500 up, upside or downside. Wow. Um, so they wanted to see if aggressive conventional hemofiltration on bypass, uh, what the effect was on bypass urine production, the fluid balance, and the renal performance in the 24 hours after bypass procedures in adults. So what they did, they did a prospective randomized study to determine the effects of conventional hemo hemofiltration during bypass, and they monitored the urine dynamics intraoperatively and in a 24-hour post-office period. They took 49 patients in the conventional ultrafiltration group called CUF, and they took 47 patients that did not receive um, ultrafiltration. So here's, here's where the results. First of all, they looked at the ending bypass hematocrit. Ending meaning as the patient was being wheeled out of the room, the end of the surgery. And the, the ultrafiltration group, the hematocrit 
ranged average was 30, hematocrit 30, plus or minus 6. And the non-ultrafiltration group, hematocrit was 26, plus or minus 2. What about intraoperative blood product usage? And the ultrafiltration group, they averaged 200 cc's plus or minus 300, meaning some people received none. Look at the non-ultrafiltration group, double the blood product usage, almost 400. What about the ending fluid balance? In the ultrafiltration group, the average person was 744 cc's, and there's a big plus or minus there. But look at the non-cuff group. The average person, 3,006 fluid uh, plus to the plus side. No significances, no significant differences in pre or post-operative creatinine values were observed. Well, here was our conclusion. Aggressive ultrafiltration can be safely used during bypass in the adult population to reduce fluid accumulation and elevate bypass hematocrits without affecting bypass or intraoperative urine production. Here's a paper by Dr. Wang and his associates in uh, 1996, Annals of Thoracic Surgery, and they looked at pediatric population, but they looked at efficacy of ultrafiltration and removing the inflammatory meters, a lot of what I was just talking about, in the pediatric population. 50 pediatric patients went on cardiac surgery. They analyzed the plasma levels of leukocyte, elastase, tumor necrosis factor again, alpha, interleukin-6, interleukin-8. All these are some of the most powerful, most harmful ones. Here's their conclusion. Ultrafiltration was efficient in removing leukocyte elastase, tumor necrosis, uh, necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6, and interleukin-8. Here's a paper by Dr. Klar and, and Bowers. Uh, they looked at deceiving coefficients to determine if the hemoconcentrator of floor inflammatory mediators during bypass. So they just wanted to focus on the four. And their conclusion was mediators are efficaciously removed by the hemoconcentrator and may result in an attenuated inflammatory response. So now here's a paper by Dr. Tallman and, and, and oh, yeah, Dumont. Richard Tallman from okay. Ohio State. Okay, in 2002. Uh, they looked at, again, the inflammatory mediator removal by zero Z-buff ultrafiltration during bypass. Okay, this was probably 2002, came out in perfusion. 30 adult patients, open heart procedure, randomized control study with either ultrafiltration or not. The Z-buff solution was plasmolite. <clears throat> by the way, that's an important topic we can bring up about the Z-buff solution. That's used. Yes, a very They use plasmolite, which makes sense because it's an uh, ionically balanced solution. Yes. The filtrate itself was analyzed for the presence of interleuc interleukins, one and six, tumor necrosis factor A, complement factors three and five. Here's our conclusion. This study demonstrates that ultrafiltration is a strategy that can be used during bypass in the adult to remove significant amounts of inflammatory mediators. <coughs> I hear this all the time. Well, you're going to dehydrate the patient. Chip dry. Desiccate them. Well, it's not really uh, complicated. If you have, unless you have concentrated the patient to a higher hematocrit, higher than your pre-bypass hematocrit, by definition, the patient's still hemodiluted. Uh, yeah, I don't makes know sense how many. Me. I don't know how many studies you want to put up there. The bottom line is, if you have a pre-hematocrit immediately before going on bypass, whatever number you want to use, thirty-five, and you go on pump and it's twenty-five and you hemoconcentrate up to 32, by definition, you're still hemodiluted. Well, yes and no, because I mean, you could, of course, now, have lost it, some it, cells it, in the lapse. Yeah. There's, there could, are some it, unless you're factors, having he, Unless you're having hemolysis, yeah. 10 a great degree, which I don't, I, it could be a, a, a rare case. Now, if you have so much volume and you've added red cells and you've hemoconcentrated way beyond your baseline hematocrit, uh, I suppose, you know, you could look into that. I, I've done thousands of cases, and I don't know if I can think of one without adding red cells. Yeah. <clears throat> and by the way, if I use my hemoconcentrator, I didn't need to need to add red That's cells. That's right. <laughs> so um, uh, then people say, you know, I heard this when I was in my travels. They said, well. Can we open the phone lines and we bring don't, Keith we, in? We don't want to dehydrate. Oh, was that your the, last slide? I think I got a cold Wait. more, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't for, did, forgive me. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No. So I heard this. You know, I said, "Well, we don't want to dehydrate the patient." I'm like, "Well, what's your hematocrit? 28. What was your pre-bypass hematocrit? 35." I said, well, "Why are you dehydrating the patient when you're still diluted? Um, does it cause acute kidney injury?" Well, 
I've yet to be able to discover, and anyone's been able to present to me, any prospective double-blind multicenter study which had demonstrated ultrafiltration, ultrafiltration contributes to acute kidney injury. In fact, we have almost 40 or 50 years of evidence that shows that the opposite is true. There's been decades of numerous studies that have verified that early institution of, ultra, of hemofiltration leads to a significant restoration of renal function. It was stated that in, in Gravely's book back in 2000. The improvements to the renal function are considered to be the result of removing the toxic metabolites and the inflammatory mediators. So <clears throat> here's my conclusion. Ultrafiltration is a valuable method for removing excess plasma water and a myriad of pro-inflammatory pro agents during bypass. And numerous studies indicate that it leads to an improvement in the general post-operative state of the patient. The primary consideration arguing against the use of ultrafiltration would be the extra costs, which I've heard, and providing this intervention adds blood exposure to an additional artificial surface area. The use of ultrafiltration is safe, and there are no known contraindications for its use. Concerns associated with use are heavily outweighed by its proven value in reducing intravascular volume, preserving post-operative hemostasis, and improving post operative and organ function. And here are the 73 reference articles from Gravely's book that just focused only on the hemostasis section. The homeostasis, homeostasis and hemostasis. The whole hemofiltration section, I'm sorry. Okay. The whole ultrafiltration section. Very good, okay. Let's bring everybody in. You brought up some, I mean, I wanted to stop you about 50 times <coughs> because there's so much information there <coughs> and so much of it uh, was valuable. You know, there's this, this idea, you know, first of all, CVVH, you know, it, how can we say that a therapy, you know, and there's several big companies, Baxter Gambro, Next Stage, B. Braun, you name it, have devices specifically designed to treat the patient in the ICU with continuous ultrafiltration, continuous veno veno hemofiltration, because you're replacing the volume with what you want the plasma water to look at, look like. And you can also remove volume from the patient when they're fluid overloaded. Again, going back to my earlier statement, no one is advocating taking a patient who has heat stroke and ultrafiltrating that patient. We're talking about patients who are almost I don't know of a time I have ever seen a patient where I'm getting ready to go on bypass, unless it's a trauma, but a routine coronary or routine valve that was not hypervolemic just from anesthesia. They may have come in the hospital dry, but they're not dry right now. Um, we've seen big drops in hematocrit, all the indicators that we have to, to recognize that, plus the pump run, plus the cardioplegia. We'll talk more about that tomorrow, but I don't know how you can take a, a, a system that is used thousands of times a day, a hemoconcentrator in the ICU, and say when you remove it from the ICU, when you put it in to treat patients' kidneys, to rest their kidneys, to make their kidneys better, when you take it to the operating room and hook it to the heart-lung machine, it suddenly becomes the kidney killer. Mm -hmm. I have a real problem figuring this out. Keith? I would just think John's talk. Was that not Yeah, idea? John. Fantastic job summarizing all the articles out there. There isn't anything that shows that it causes AKI, especially Kuntz's paper. Kuntz's paper was so prolific. It's the only prospective randomized paper that shows um, that it has no difference in urine output on bypass. Um, of course, you went over the whole thing about uh, the cytokines and anaphylotoxins, which, again, are very, very much important. C3A, C5A, IL-6, IL-8, TNF-alpha, uh, bradykinins, uh, myocardial depressant factors. I mean, there's lots of papers out there that show that, especially in kids, but Talma did one too. And then there's a couple out of Europe that, said that, uh, Europe that say the exact same thing. So as far as I'm concerned, until they can come up with, these bad actors can come up with concrete evidence and we're talking about prospective randomized trials uh not retrospective multivariate uh multivariable linear linear regression papers or any of those things where they have to use hocus pocus to get to their point fuzzy math the real yeah the whole thing is there's as you said we have 40 years of evidence that shows that it's positive and you know i think that there's uh again 
a certain group, a small group, whatever, that are trying to stare the perfusion field in a certain direction and cause uh, doubt or, or you know, controversy. Uh, but again, it's all fake news, right? The fake news. Well, you know, so, uh, the problem that I have with that, and I think that uh, I, I I appreciate, you know, your passion for this. I have a similar passion, and of course, and I and I listen. I, I I respect very much you and and your thoughts, and I I I do feel also like you do that these are you know we call them bad actors or whatever we want to call them. But for me, Keith, it's really coming down to you know I guess I view it more as. Uh, being irresponsible. This is this is being irresponsible <clears throat> to the patients that we are entrusted to care for. There's that's that's really for me where the bottom line to this is. You know, to 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 advocate that something that has been demonstrated for all these years that has so much benefit in so many different mm -hmm. aspects when used properly. Again, everything we're discussing here is under the, is predicated on appropriate use, not on just use for the sake of use like anything else, but to advocate that somehow that is causing harm based upon really no credible evidence is irresponsible and it's very concerning to me that 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 a platform actually exists for that irresponsible uh, irresponsibility to be disseminated so you know it isn't and 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 i'm not trying to i don't want to pick on anybody you know i don't want to really i don't want to cause my own controversy but you know these people wrote this article and these people had a platform in which to present that information and they or to to publish that information. And that stuff is supposed to be edited. Somebody is supposed to review that for its integrity. And uh, I don't know how it got through. And that concerns well, me equally. Well, I could interject something just in general. Uh, you can probably Google this. I think the number, and I could be wrong, it's very high. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of 60, 70, even maybe more percent of all medical research cannot be duplicated by someone else. Can't be duplicated by someone else. You, you, you do a study, and for whatever reason, someone else does it, and they don't find exactly that. Mm -hmm. But when you do find that many, many, many people have done a similar study, and they find the same thing, it removes all these inflammatory mediators. It improves organ function. Now you're talking about something that is overwhelmingly, I mean, obvious. I, I, I'm, mm. I'm almost surprised we've been talking about this. Me too. It's kind of like Me saying, too. you know, kind of like too. saying, should, should we turn the oxygen on, on the, in the in the in the in the, in the, on the oxygen or change? Yeah, four I mean, minutes. You have yeah, four minutes. Yeah, yeah, four minutes. So I mean, you know, I uh, I, I don't know. I mean, um, when you look at the history of what I showed you and how it evolved, <clears throat> when they first started in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we were using hemoconcentrate a lot for a couple of reasons. Number one, our prime volumes were large. The circuits were larger, and we used a lot of cardioplegia because most of it was two, three liters of straight crystalloid. So you use a lot of hemoconcentrate. And people were saying, this is great in the beginning because we can now use patients that don't have good renal function, kind of cardiac surgery, people that are fluid overloaded. Why don't we apply it to them? That's all what they were really doing. And we can come off bypass without higher, higher hematocrits and not give people blood. Nobody was looking to see that thought it was going to improve organ function. Mm -hmm. This came up on its own. Mm -hmm. that people didn't have to use the vent nearly as much, mm -hmm. that cardiac function was better, didn't need as many balloon pumps, there wasn't myocardial edema. People were waking up sooner because mm -hmm. neurological benefits were there. Mm -hmm. People didn't have as much uh, serum creatinine uh, spike, spike or better urine output. Nobody was looking for this. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if you're doing an experiment... Almost accidentally found. Well, uh, my point is if you're doing an experiment and you're doing something and you're saying, okay, we're going to do this and we're maybe going to see... Uh, less uh, less weight, the patient will weigh less because they're going to have less food on board. We, we're pretty sure that's going to happen. And maybe they're going to have higher hematocrits. We're looking for this. And all of a sudden, you start seeing these other benefits you weren't even looking for. Nine times out of ten, they must have been pretty profound because they came at you. You weren't mm -hmm. looking for them, mm -hmm. right? And that's what happened with all this organ benefit, all this end organ improvement. They, weren't, they didn't know that was going to happen. And then they started asking the question, well, why is this happening? Every time we use hemoconcentrator, 
patients are extubated faster. They wake up, all these things. And they started studying, what, what is this thing removing? The cardiac And they found out that it's removing, I mean, I just listed a handful. Like Keith was saying, there's far more things you could, you could mm -hmm. talk about that it's removing. And everybody who's looked at that has found that it removes all mm -hmm. of these inflammatory meters. Mm -hmm. And even pyrogens, even the infection load on patients was reduced. Something that people don't even discuss. So, you know, um, on the other hand, there's never been a paper that's come out and said, well, wait a second, it does all these benefits, but it has this harm over here. I've never seen one. In I fact, everything either. you read says there's no contraindications to using a concentrator. Mm -hmm. I mean, other than you could say you're increasing the surface area or the cost. Mm -hmm. um, the number, there's two huge negatives to, to cardiopulmonary bypass. There's many, many. But number one and number two are the disruption of the coagulation system and the serious response. The hemoconcentrator comes along as the only device that takes a big bite out of the Sears response. The, the only one that takes a big bite out of it, that pushes us, this huge negative to bypass, pushes us a little bit in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has at least a dozen benefits and talk about fluid overload and myomatic rate, but well, just know, the Sears response alone well, you know, is, is, is significant. I agree, and you know, and, and that's true, and we, we oh wait, What's happening? Huh? I can't hear you. Get him, Keith. Oh, I don't. See I'm you. still. Yeah, I'm still here. Point. You're pointing, and there's nobody. There was nobody there. Oh, there He's he is. There now. Keith there. He wasn't there. They're pointing at me, and the you know the engineers are pointing at something, and all I see is myself, and they're pointing at me. It's like, what's wrong with me? All right, Keith, you're here. They told me to stop talking, let you talk. Okay, well, you guys are burning it up. There's no doubt about it. And as I said, Kuntz's paper is the definitive paper. We need to get him involved. Um, the other thing that I think a lot of people, uh, or at least a lot of my customers, John, you said there were two things, right? Cirrus and uh, coagulation. But the hemobag type devices where you save blood at the end, that affects number one, that coagulation you know, discrepancy. You get your clotting factors back and you, you do much better. The other thing that I hear a lot, I mean a lot from a lot of customers globally, is that when they get back to the unit, usually there's no nurse to be found standing at the bed because the patient's so stable. When the surgeon comes back from talking to the family, they're not sitting around trying to balance the, the IVs and uh, the pressors and this and that and the other thing. Patient's stable. When they get to the ICU, it's homeostasis. There's no more fluid shifts faster back to baseline than there is with people that have gotten a lot of fluids or are mismanaged with. Uh, and the other thing that you talked about briefly, but I just have to really beat it, is anytime someone gets a unit of blood, it increases their uh, chances for AKI. Right. I mean, there's Huge. lots of papers out there that Huge. show that. Huge. So right. if you've got a patient who's a borderline and you don't want to use a hemoconcentrator, but you're going to give him a unit of blood anyways, well, you just increases his chances of AKI. And that was not related to ultrafiltration. And not just AKI, but a whole host of other unwanted problems. Correct. So it's, it's blood is, you know, blood is, is, is an, unfor an unfortunate dichotomy. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. There's sometimes you absolutely need it. But I do think it is our responsibility to limit its use when possible. I mean, I think, I, again, I, I, I'm baffled that someone would give, have mm -hmm. three liters in their oxygenator, a hematocrit of 19, and they would give two units of PEC cells. Mm -hmm. Why in the heck would you do that? Now, how much volume do you have in your reservoir? <laughs> yeah, I, it just, I just can't, I cannot, I cannot understand it. But we haven't even touched on, and I'm going to do that a little bit more tomorrow. We haven't even touched on the benefit of reducing third spacing, mm -hmm. which reduces interstitial edema, which which in turn reduces the microcirculation. So we haven't talked about, we didn't even we discuss those that, benefits no. in this mm -hmm. talk. It's such a complex uh, issue. And then the, the other thing though, I do want to mention is we all need to learn a little more about these bicarb based solutions, because when you do, even using Normasol and Plasmalite, when you do high volume CVVH or continuous ultrafiltration with replacement fluid, however you want to zero balance, ultra Z buff, whatever you want to call it. There's so many, it's alphabet soup, really. It's a, mm -hmm. 
you know, what, what I'm talking about is those high volumes where you're removing 10 liters, but you're giving back eight of those liters in a continuous fashion so that you're removing some mm -hmm. fluid that you're hypervolemic with, but mm -hmm. you're also removing all of those evil humors, as we'll call them, mm -hmm. the cytokines, interleukins, and so forth, uh, that the bicarb-based solutions that exist and readily available, they're commercially available, make a lot of sense. They make a lot of sense, and, and I think we need to use, uh, we need to really explore those as a priming volume more so than only using the acetate based uh, solutions, which dilute the bicarbon and, and can become somewhat problematic, I believe. Yeah, I think you need to touch more on the, certainly the microcirculation. And of course, the big hot, hot topic nowadays is the glycocalyx and protecting the glycocalyx. And what protects it? Albumin. I'll be able, well, that's, right. you're giving that talk in June right here. You're giving that talk in June on albumin and uh, its, its benefits and how we, you know, we don't treat hypoalbuminemia and how devastating that particular uh, problem is. We have five well, minutes. You know what's, okay. Say when, uh, mm -hmm. just briefly, um, People, you know, they're like, oh, I give a couple of units uh, or I give a couple of bottles of albumin uh, on the case. And then at the end of the case, they just send like a liter or two over to the cell washer and they give back. just. Oh, my uh, God. I know. And, and, and I was like, well, you, 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 you had it and then you threw it away. Yep. So, yeah. Well, you know, but why don't we treat why don't we treat the COP anymore? I mean, that's just a, yet another discussion. Why do we not yeah. measure albumin? They measure it when the patient's in the ICU for a reason, even though I've seen some people not treat it with uh, with um, with uh, with with an albumin level of 1.2. I've seen I've seen albumin levels of 1.2 and the patient looked like didn't look human. Well, 3.2. Anything less than that is considered Danger, but that's damage, an in, so. that anything under actually an albumin under two is an independent indicator of mortality, an indicate an independent predictor of mortality under two. And there are pl plenty of papers that show that. Yes. So we didn't even discuss that. So you're maintaining not only your hemoglobin, you're maintaining not only your perfusion by decreasing this third spacing, you're maintaining your albumin levels. Your proteins, your clotting, but when you come off bypass, you have pro clotting proteins to actually help to create hemostasis to get out of the operating room. Keith, your hemo, hemo bag does the same thing. If you come off bypass and you have a lot of volume, you know, why would you put that to the cell saver and just give back red blood cells and throw away all of those essential proteins? Doesn't make sense to me. And then give FFP. I work yeah. at a place where active cardiac surgery program doesn't use a cell saver. Mm -hmm. Just don't use it. Um, what little suction you have went to the wall and all the blood volume and the pump went back to the patient. But you have to have somebody and, who truly respects you know, how important it is to have good surgical hemostasis. Mm -hmm. They can't be sloppy surgeons and they can't just, you know, let the, the, the chest wall from the mammary dissection bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed and have two late leaders in the left chest at the end of the case, they I mean, have to be respectful of that. I, I don't, I don't advocate that because you need to be able to have the cell saver, and you need to save whatever you can save. You can mm -hmm. have very little blood loss. But I know some people don't surgery. use the pump sucker, and uh, they never yeah, use I, it. I, I worked, I worked, I worked with, and all the case, during the case, the, all the all the suction went to the cell saver. So, I mean, it's very, very valuable tool. The cell saver is very mm -hmm. valuable tool. It is agreed. Um, and I don't really look at it as a competitor, except with the blood pump volume at the end. I mean, if, you, if you're if you so inclined to really concentrate it and give it back as whole blood, I think there's significant benefits to all, all the same things you guys have talked about. I think you there know? is too. I think every tool that we use currently, whether it be the cell saver, right. the hemoconcentrator, the heart-lung machine, uh, cardioplegia, uh, Del Nido, it, whatever it is, everything we do depends on its prudent and mm -hmm. proper use. You only give as much as you actually need. You only do as much as you absolutely must. You know, you, you try to find that line. Now, it's very hard to be perfect, nobody is, but you know, you don't just willy-nilly do something 
to excess every time, or you say, I do this on every patient mm -hmm. regardless, you know, without a justification for it. You've, you've, you just have to be able to say that I've thought this through. And I think that this case, you can't treat today's case like yesterday's case or tomorrow's case. You have to treat each case as its own case and consider the patient and what's in their best interest at the time, given the knowledge that, uh, that you have um, and, uh, and what evidence exists. That's my bottom line. I would say something interesting too. There is a huge, once they came out with the Aiken and the things that you talked about, the um, criteria was Rifle. more defined yes. for acute kidney injury. They actually find that when people look at it now with those criteria, the, the, the uh, post Regular post bypass AKI is actually quite a bit higher than 20%. It's more mm -hmm. like 30 to 40%. Some people say it's even higher than that. Whatever the number is, let's just say it's the 20 or 30% that, that of regular bypass patients have a bump in their serum creatinine. Mm -hmm. I want people to understand something. The vast majority of those people didn't have a hemoconcentrator. So in other words, you have this huge percentage of people experiencing AKI. Mm -hmm. 80, 90% of those probably didn't have hemoconcentrate in their case. Mm -hmm. So what's your explanation for that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have You one. see what I'm saying? I mean, that, if, you're, if you're saying hemoconcentrate is causing AKI, you've got the vast majority of people coming out of bypass with AKI, they didn't have hemoconcentrate in their yeah. case. That's a very good point. <laughs> It's a very, well, you know, I'll tell you something else about critically ill patients, post-op cardiac surgery patients, <clears throat> and uh, and using creatinine. Not only is it a very slow marker, it's delayed, in very other delayed, words, yeah. but you, if when you have a patient that does have AKI and their creatinine is actually going up, but you're treating them with fluid resuscitation, you dilute it back down mm -hmm, right. and you don't, so not only is it delayed, but it gets masked. Falsely lowered, yeah. So mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a whole lot mm -hmm. to this, right. besides, as you said, Keith, a, uh, a voodoo regression, linear regression of the hypotenuse of some triangle <laughs> somewhere in the middle of Bermuda. <laughs> Listen, you guys are doing a great job. Uh, tomorrow, it looks like you're starting off pretty early, 9.45 or 10 o'clock? Yes, that uh, is correct. Okay, so I'd like to try and call, you know, call in again tomorrow. Love especially to I want to want to hear that talk uh, about the fluid overload is deadly. I mean, obviously, it, it all boils down to, I'm going to be honest with you, call it osmotic pressure, microvascular, you know, the vascular tone, but it's all microvascular fluid movement. And that's uh, it's going to be interesting to list to see what slides you got to. You're going to be really proud of me, okay? You're going to be proud of me tomorrow because I'm going to talk about the mean systemic fluid vo the uh, fluid volume pressure, so the uh, the PMSF. So I think okay. you're going to be very proud of me when you talk about that microcirculatory flow that you're talking about and how all of that interacts. So I, I've, I've looked into that and I think you're going to find some interesting information. Well, thank you for including me tonight with your uh, discussions. Thank you too, sir, very much. It's good talking to you. Be safe. Thanks, John. Bye. Thank you.